Welcome to the 2021 Telehealth Summit brought to you by the California Telehealth Resource Center. We're glad you could join us for today's session on the California and federal policy landscape post COVID-19 pandemic. I am Erin Hickman. I'm a pediatrician and clinical informaticist, and I will be your moderator today. We invite you to turn on your video for a more interactive experience. Today's session is purely for informational purposes. The California Telehealth Resource Center has no relevant financial interest arrangement or affiliation with any organizations related to commercial products or services discussed during the Telehealth Summit. Before we begin, I wanted to review a few Zoom tips for Zoom platform we're using today. At the top right of your Zoom window, you can toggle between speaker view, which will show you just the video of who is speaking, or gallery view to see all participants with video turned on. Closed captioning is enabled. If you like to view subtitles or a running transcript in a separate window, you can access them via the live transcript icon on your Zoom control bar. Today's session is being recorded and will be posted to the CTRC YouTube channel next week. Lastly, please feel free to post your questions in the Zoom chat window. We'll hold the last 10 minutes of today's session for Q&A. With that, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Mei Kwong. For, from the Center for Connected Health Policy. May has over a decade of experience in state and federal policy work. She is currently the executive director for the Center for Connected Health Policy, the federal design national, health, national telehealth policy resource center. She's written numerous policy briefs, created state legislation, and led several coalitions efforts on a variety of issues. Ms. Kwong has published several articles on telehealth and telehealth policy, in various peer-reviewed journals, and is the co-author of the CCHP's 50-State Medicaid Telehealth Reimbursement Survey. She is recognized as an expert on telehealth policy and has been consulted by state and federal lawmakers on telehealth legislation and policy. May, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Hickman, and thank you to CTRC for inviting me and having me here today, and thank you everyone for attending the session. So like CTRC, I always have to start off with disclaimers as well. So any information I provide in today's talk is not to be considered legal advice. It is for informational purposes only. CCHP always recommends that you consult with legal counsel if you are interested in formal legal opinion. And also know that if I happen to mention a company or show a picture of a product, know that neither I nor CCHP has any type of relevant financial interest relationship or arrangement with such a company or organization. Just a really quick background on CCHP. We were actually established as a California telehealth organization back in 2009 as a program underneath the Public Health Institute. But an opportunity to become the federally designated National Telehealth Policy Resource Center through a grant from HRSA became available in 2012. CCHP applied for that, we got it, and we've been serving in that capacity ever since. We also work with a variety of other funders and partners on the state and federal levels on more specific projects or research projects related to telehealth policy. We also act as an administrator for the National Consortium of Telehealth Research Centers. Now, for those who are not familiar with that, those are the 14 telehealth research centers underneath the same grant program as CCHP. CTRC is one of them. CTRC is one of the regional telehealth resource centers and the regionals cover specific states. California is lucky to have CTRC, we have our own. Other states have to share a resource center. Um, but a couple of years ago, the 14 telehealth resource centers um, decided that we wanted to work more collaboratively on joint projects. So we assign a bit of our federal funding into a common pot where we work on collaborative projects together. And CCHP was selected to act as an administrator for those funds. But really, we just provide a point of contact and we do some of like the background administrative work. We oversee the one staff member we have for it. It is really a joint and collaborative process that we work with all 14. We are also, CCHP is the convener for the California Telehealth Policy Coalition, and I took a quick peek as to who was attending the session. I think there are a couple of members that we have um, who are members of the coalition. So the coalition was started by CCHP as sort of an ad hoc group back in 2011 when AB 415, which was the Telehealth Development Act, was going through the legislative process. A couple of groups such as CPCA and the Hospital Association and the California Rural Health Association wanted to be updated on the progress of that bill. So from about five different individual organizations that were just meeting to follow the progress of this bill, 
It's now grown into like 100 statewide groups and national groups because we have a few national um, organizations that are members of the coalition as well. And the, the purpose behind the coalition is really to try to advance California telehealth policy. And again, we work in a very collaborative manner and CCHP act as the convener. So if you're interested in learning more about the coalition or joining it, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to like include you in the emails and the meeting notices. But you're here to hear about the landscape on telehealth policy. And I'm gonna cover both federal and what's going on in the states in general, and then get very more specific on what's going on in California. Now, obviously we're still in the midst of COVID, we're in the middle of a surge. So this is not quite the post COVID landscape that you know, I think we were hoping we would be in by this point. Um, but we do have an idea of what some of the permanent changes might look like because there are some permanent changes being made. The slide in front of you is really your 20,000 foot level overview of what happened with telehealth policy during the pandemic. And these were for the most part temporary changes. So you have your federal on the in the blue and the state on the red. And as you can see, like as far as issue area that were touched upon on where those telehealth policy changes were made, at least on a temporary basis, a lot of commonalities of what was going on in the federal and the state level. And that's because a lot of the telehealth specific policy that existed before COVID-19 were very, have very common elements. And a lot of it was really based around reimbursement. And the common elements were such things as, you know, what services could be reimbursed, what modality could you use in order to get reimbursed, what provider, et cetera. There were a couple of other areas, policy areas that were touched on both on the federal and state level um, because it impacted how you use telehealth, such as like prescribing. You see there's a bullet point there about the DEA and prescribing control substances and also like licensure, which you see is more on the state side as opposed to on the federal side. So you have this whole sort of broad range of and various different policies going on in the state and federal level that in the beginning of COVID-19 were for the most part all temporary. Now, what are we seeing being made permanent? And it's it's varied. So there's been you know, some things that have happened on the federal level, the more permanent action has really happened on the state level. But we're starting to see at least some of the things shake out and like where it may go when eventually we get through this pandemic. So on the federal level, first thing, so to understand the federal telehealth policy landscape, you have to understand that it is primarily centered around Medicare. I, I mentioned a moment ago that there were things such as the DEA with prescribing, yes, that does exist. But for tel telehealth specific policy, Medicare is where the concentration of most of those policies are and where most of the waivers happen. Now with your Medicare telehealth policy though, a lot of that is embedded in federal law though. So you literally do need an act of Congress in order to like get that change made permanently. And you know, Congress is dealing with a lot of things right now. So this may not necessarily be taken up with um, immediately on tele making telehealth permanent changes. So, so that's moved a little bit slower in like making permanent some of those statutory changes that are needed um, once this pandemic is over and once these waivers roll back. But there's another way in which you can make um, policies permanent on the federal level, and that's an administrative action. So that's action that CMS can take. Now, they're pretty limited in what they can do because again, most of that, that policy is embedded in the federal statute, so you would need Congress to act, but there is some leeway that CMS has to act. And the way they would typically go through it is through the physician fee schedule. For those who are not familiar with the physician fee schedule, it's released every summer um, for the year be, uh, before proposing changes for the following year. So for changes, to take place in 2022, the physician fee schedule proposal was released in the summer of 2021, back in July. These are proposals Medicare make to say, you know, what we're going to do new in the Medicare program. And this is where they've embedded some, some changes for like telehealth policy. There's usually a 60 day comment period because what they release initially, again, is a proposal. They're supposed to take public comment and then they finalize it it's usually November, they sometimes have been a little late and it's been in early December, but it's typically around November where it's finalized. So what was in this most recent proposal? So a couple of things. Um, one of the things that we typically see in the physician fee schedule for telehealth is if Medicare is going to add new services to that permanent telehealth list, eligible telehealth list for services. And typically, CMS has like, you know, proposed adding one or two new services every year. 
this year they did not add services. What they did do though was extend some temporary services. So last year, what happened is that um, CMS created a temporary holding bucket for services that they weren't gonna put on the term, uh, permanent telehealth eligible list, but that they said were, we kind of need a little bit more time to decide if there's enough evidence to like justify putting them on the permanent list. So we're gonna put them in this little temporary holding bucket called category three. And we're going to say that these services will stick around until the end of the year when the public health emergency is declared over. Now, that's what they said last year for going into 2021. This year, what they're proposing is, you know, for that category three temporary bucket, bucket, we're actually going to like keep them around until the end of 2023. So they're changing the expiration date on those temporary services. So what does that, that mean? So you basically have three, three, I don't want to use the word categories, you have um, three different areas that services fall in. You have your permanent telehealth eligible list of services that CMS will reimburse for. So it doesn't matter if the public health emergency is declared over, this is on the permanent list. Those services are going to stick around and be eligible to be provided via telehealth and providers will get reimbursed for them. Then you got your category three, which CMS is proposing like it's temporary but it's gonna stick around until the end of 2023. And then you have like your, your um, COVID-19 temporary list that did not fall into one of the uh, two previous categories or two previous buckets, which if the public health emergency is declared over tomorrow, they would automatically go away. They would no longer be eligible. So those are like kind of the three categories or three buckets of services that you have. Services that are still around now because we're in the middle of public health emergency, but can go away. Um, and then services that will stick around at least temporarily until 2023 and then like a permanent list. So that that's where that sounds like it's a little bit complicated, but but once you get the hang of it, you'll you'll think you'll see like, you know, how that works. So but it is it can get a little bit confusing when you first look at it if you're not following it, you know, regularly. So what were the other changes? Now, those were actually kind of small changes when you compare to some of the proposals that they made that we're gonna cover now. Um, and a lot of them are around mental health services. The first one is actually not something that CMS proposed to do. They were, they were required to do it because in December of 2020, Congress passed the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Now in that bill, there were some telehealth items in there, but there were no items related to making temporary measures permanent. What there was in there was items related not to like the temporary waivers, but Congress decided to pass. And one of them was the provision of mental health services via telehealth in the Medicare program. The, the section of that bill that related to this said that um, providers could provide mental health services to patients and the geographic restrictions that's in, in Medicare regarding telehealth would not apply and, you, and the patient could be located in the home. Um, however, there needed to be a six month in-person visit prior to the beginning of those telehealth services. So if you didn't have that last part there, it kind of looked great because you would not have the geographic restriction, patients could be at home and they can receive telehealth ser uh, services for mental health or mental health services via telehealth. However, with that extra caveat of like having that six months in-person visit, that kind of really narrowed the scope or the, the reach of like what that provision did. So that's actually embedded in federal law. So CMS has to like implement it now so through regulations. So what they proposed was basically to implement that, but they added in something that was not a federal law. This was something that they're suggesting to do, which was that they were going to require um, the six months visit to take place before each telehealth visit. So what that means is, for example, you're a patient you do your in-person visit with that telehealth provider, and then you start getting your visits via telehealth. And you, you've done your in-person visit at least six months before like that telehealth visit. So, so you're good. But then if you have a telehealth visit with that telehealth provider eight months later, you're gonna need another in-person visit with that telehealth provider. So you have, you're on the six month cycle of always getting that in-person visit in order to qualify those telehealth visits. That wasn't technically, that was not in the statute, 
it wasn't clear. So it, it basically just said like you would have to have a six month visit. So they did not have in the statute that it needed to be repeated. This is something that CMS has come up with and it's a proposal. So this is a proposal stage with these proposed regulations. They are taking public comments. So if, if people have um, some ideas about this or some comments that they wanna make, this is your opportunity. So that is like one thing that was also in the physician schedule. Now we're getting into the stuff that is a little bit new and a little bit different in how CMS has approached things before. Audio only, we're, we all know audio only was very big during, during the early months of pandemic, still even now, because there was recognition that not everybody would have access to the technology or connectivity in order to do live video. So they needed to do audio only as, at the very least as a backup for folks who may not have that connection or that access through live video um, uh, or not have the devices to like maybe ensure that they could take uh, have a live video interaction. So audio only, it has been sort of a bit of a, an issue with policymakers and like, you know, what do you keep around with audio only? Do we even keep it around or do we limit it in some way? So CMS before has always said that, you know, we really don't have control over what modality issues that's like in the statute and and CCHP, we've definitely been, I think, one of a couple other folks, we've been arguing with CMS for years in that what it says in the fe in federal law is that telehealth is delivered through a telecommunication system. That is not defined in federal law. So technically CMS can define it how they want. So CMS has not really like taken advantage of what we thought was something within their wheelhouse to do, within their powers to do until now. So they have decided that they will take advantage of that and include audio only in there, but only for mental health services. And only if certain conditions are met. And those certain conditions are, it's for an established patient, the patient is at home, the provider has the capability of doing live video, sort of a backup. And, you know, this is like the patient's choice or, you know, they, they don't have access to live video. And again, they're adding that has an in-person visit with the telehealth provider six months prior. So, so it was good to see CMS taking advantage of what we had always thought was in their powers to do, which was to have a more expansive definition as to what a telecommunication system was, in which means what type of modality is used to deliver services via telehealth. But they did it in a very narrow way. Again, it was just for mental health services, and there were certain conditions that had to happen in order to allow audio only to be used. And the reasoning for all this was they thought that Audio only lent itself well to be providing mental health services. They also recognize that there's probably going to be increased need for mental health services. And they were very concerned that certain segments of the population wouldn't be able to access it via telehealth or other or in person. So audio only may have been the only way for them to get to those services. So that was significant in that they, they decided that they were going to redefine or have a more expansive definition for telecommunication system. FQHCs and RHCs. For those who are not familiar, again, what's embedded in federal law is the list of eligible providers who are able to provide services via telehealth and get reimbursed underneath the Medicare program. FQHCs and RHCs do not qualify. They are not on that list. And that list is pretty specific. So that has been like a, a problem over the years. And there have been many bills introduced to like try to rectify that, to try to change that. The pandemic hits that limitation is temporary waived and not just for FQHCs and RHCs. I mean, allied health professionals like PTs and OTs are also not on the eligible list. That was waived during the pandemic. So we still have this problem. Now this is something technically adding providers onto like that eligible list, CMS actually cannot do. But what CMS did was they decided to redefine what a visit, a mental health visit meant for an FQHC and RHC. So they said they were proposing that a new definition for mental health visit for an FQHC or an RHC would also include encounters furnished through real-time telecommunications technology. What that means is you can use live video or audio only. What it also means was because this is a re redefinition of a term of a mental health visit, this does not count as telehealth for those FQHCs. So, so they kind of got around the whole, it's in statute on how, you know, who can be a provider to deliver telehealth by saying that, 
Well, it's not telehealth, it's, it's how we're defining the, the term visit, mental health visit for these institutions. So that also means then that those telehealth limitations that you see in statutes such as needs to take place in the rural area and it's very specific what type of rural area, they don't apply either because this is, again, a definition for mental health visit as opposed to saying FQHCs and RHCs can be a telehealth provider. And one other thing is that for these um, services, FQHCs and RACs would be paid their usual rate to their PPS or error rate. This is the audio only portion of things too. Um, again, the, the only kind of requirement that they had for FQHC and RHC was that the patient couldn't use live video or wanted to use you know, audio only. Now, the thing is, is that they are considering, they haven't proposed it yet, but they, they wanted opinions on this of like, you know what, should we also ask for that six month in person visit when we're talking about FQHCs and RHCs? And the way it was written, it, it, it meant for both live video and audio only. That's the way it looked like to me. So um, again, if you have a particular opinion on that, I would suggest that you send in comments to um, CMS regarding this. And the comment period is coming on upon us pretty quickly. I believe it's September 13th is when they close and they said they have to receive comments by 5 p.m. Eastern. So for the California folks or people on the West Coast, think of that as Eastern time when, they, when you look at the deadline. A couple of other things that were in there. So for, for folks who um, follow the Medicare policy, you know, uh, pretty closely, you know that CMS has sort of like two buckets and how they approach services that are provided via telehealth technology. You have your telehealth bucket, which has all those policies established in federal law and like, you know, it needs to take place in a rural area, can only be these list of providers. And then they have another bucket called communications technology-based services. Now these are, these are CTBS, that's the acronym for it, communications technology-based services, utilize telehealth technologies to provide those services, but CMS does not regard them as telehealth. And the way they distinguish it is that telehealth is a replacement for an in-person visit, such as you go in for an office consultation in person. You can do that via telehealth. It's a one-to-one -one replacement. Communications technology-based services are services that they normally don't take place in person that technology allows them to, allows a provider to provide these services, but there's sort of no in-person equivalent. So this is where your remote patient monitoring um, type of services like fit in because for example, let's say you're doing remote patient monitoring for somebody with hypertension, that data is like being sent into um, the provider's office like on a regular basis, maybe a couple times a day or something you're not seeing like a patient go in physically to the practitioner's office and like having their blood pressure readings taken like a couple times a day for like a couple of days in a row. So, so that see that as sort of an example of how they distinguished it. Now, the thing is with the communications technology-based services bucket, because they don't regard it as telehealth, none of those limitations apply then that you normally apply to telehealth, such as needs to like take place in a rural area. It's only these providers can provide it. They have their own other limitations, like CMS puts other limitations around them, but your typical telehealth limitations would not apply to them unless CMS says so, um, because they've like put certain rules around them, but they typically don't apply because it's not regarded as telehealth services. So that's that background for, for this proposal, which is remote therapeutic monitoring, which is another set of um, codes and services that they're proposing to basically start reimbursing for. So it's uh, it's pretty explanatory here. I like wanted to like give you a lot of detail. I think you guys get a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, if not, just to let CTRC so you know, I'm, I'm happy if you wanna share the slides with folks. But I'm not gonna go over it because it's a little bit of a dense slide there, but I just figured you would get a copy of the slide so you had to have that handy. During the pandemic, um, there were a bunch of other sort of policy changes unrelated directly to like those specific telehealth items on reimbursement that were also made um, during those early days of the pandemic, such as, you know, supervisory requirements or, um, you know, other codes that were introduced like 2252 virtual check-in. So the, these are comments or these are proposals where they were 
are going to like, you know, propose making a permit for 2022 or asking for sort of more feedback from commentators, such as like, should we keep some of these supervisory relaxations in place, like allowing it to be take place over telehealth as opposed to like, you know, having it done by a supervisor in person. So those were a couple of some of the other things that we noticed as well were introduced in physician reschedule. Now, the other way on the federal level in which you can make a permanent change is obviously through legislation. Right now, CCHP, we're tracking over 100 pieces of federal legislation that have some sort of telehealth element in it. Um, a lot of these bills do address some of the temporary changes that were made in COVID, or maybe they have like sort of a COVID element specific there in there. We also saw a lot of bills touching upon licensure, which became a big issue during COVID-19 because you had people perhaps stuck in states that weren't necessarily their home state and still trying to receive services from their typical providers. A lot of bills related to mental health and a lot of bills around pilots. One of the major bills related to telehealth and enacting some of changes is the Connect Act for Health. And this is being authored by Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii. Um, for those who are not familiar, Senator Schatz is a very big telehealth proponent. He has authored numerous telehealth bills in the past, a lot of them to address the, the barriers to telehealth in the Medicare program. And he's, he's, he's at it again. Um, this has sort of like been an, a little bit of an evolution. If you look at some of these bills, they've like kind of evolved over the years where he's trying to, you know, refine and hone them in order to like make sure that they're able to possibly move or give them the best possible chance to move through Congress. So what's in this bill? So in this bill, it will allow home to be um, an eligible site for all services that would remove the geographic limitations. It adds FQHCs and RHCs to the list of eligible providers. It, geographic limitation would not apply to IHS facility fees for some of these new exceptions like the homes, which I, I don't think is a big surprise for folks. Some of the other interesting things in the bill, though, it would give the secretary of HHS a little bit more leeway in, in around telehealth policy without waiting for Congress to like act. So it would give the secretary um, power to waive certain limitations such as original site, geographic limitation, limits on the technology use, et cetera. Um, and anything, you know, other limitation that the secretary might be necessary. So when COVID-19 hit, the secretary didn't have this power. They had to wait for Congress to pass a bill in order to either specifically like remove those limitations such as rural limitations, allowing tele services or, or you know give the secretary the secretary just automatically has that leeway and, and wouldn't also need to necessarily wait for a pandemic to happen so if they wanted to maybe kind of like look at removing um you know certain services or doing certain changes again they would not have to wait for congress but they would also be able to set their own policies and fee schedules for these waivers. So let me give you an example here. So let's say um, this bill passes and the secretary now suddenly has all this power. The secretary can say, without waiting for Congress, you know what, we're gonna add PTs and OTs on that eligible list of providers who can provide telehealth services. But you know what, they're gonna need to like have, you know, four in-person visits every year with their patients when they're, if, before they can do telehealth and they're only gonna get $50 for every telehealth visit. So there, it gives them that leeway and that power, but it also gives them a lot of power to kind of create almost sort of like, you know, these separate policies and tracks for that, for that exception there. So, so that was interesting to see that, you know, that, that, that was there. It's understandable because again, it, with something like the pandemic, maybe you don't want to wait for Congress. You, you want to like try to do something very quickly and be very nimble on that. But then there were, there's this ability to put all these other sort of fences and limitations on there as well too. Um, what was also in the Connect that were um, two other sections that you know they they labeled program integrity, which really means um, providing some resources to conduct audits and basically it was concern around fraud, just having some funds there to like check that over. But what was also interesting was there was also um, a, a 
a directive to say like, but some of this is also about training and education resources for providers and enrollees. So they know about telehealth, they know what's out there and what's available to them, which I think has actually been a little bit lacking. Um, I know providers, especially like during those early months of COVID-19 were very confused as to like, there's so many policy changes going on, what, what can we do? So I think it was, it's actually a really good idea for providing those training and educational resources. Um, because while, you know, CCHP and CTRC can help and educate folks, I do know there's probably a segment of the population out there who still wants something very official from like, you know, CMS or HHS that says this is, this is X, Y, and Z. So I, I actually, that second bullet, I didn't have, you know, too many issues with. I actually kind of agree there should be some, some research put in from government to provide some of this education and training resources for, for folks who may need it. And then data and testing models. So the secretary would collect and analyze data for both telehealth and that communications technology based service, CB, CTBS. There was a reason I spent all that time trying explaining it to folks who were not familiar with it um, because it's, it's a part of this bill. They would like do the data, do some data and analyzing on this and submit reports to Congress regarding it. And this is all concern about, you know, What's the efficacy of telehealth? What's, what's the data behind it that proves that it's as good or as effective? For those who are interested, with CCHP did do a fact sheet. So that's the link to our fact sheet on that bill. And now we're gonna move on into the states and like what they do in general. So for the most part, state Medicaid programs, every state's reimbursing in their permanent policies for some type of live video. And that was actually what happened before COVID-19. So in their permanent policies, every state's doing something with live video in their Medicaid program. Store for remote patient monitoring, not as popular, but you know, a good many states are doing that. Almost, almost half with store forward and then a little bit over half with remote patient monitoring. Private payer laws are sort of the other element there with states in that states have private payer laws directing how insurance companies, commercial insurance companies deal with telehealth. These laws range from everything from a state saying, health plan, you can cover telehealth if you want to, all the way to a state law saying, health plan, you shall cover telehealth same way you would have in person. And by the way, you will pay the same amount for that service as you would have in person. And then everybody else kind of falls in between. And that, that really also kind of dictated in those early days of COVID-19, how states were directing commercial health plans in like coverage for telehealth too. Audio only. Um, this is, I will tell you, this is in flux all the time here. This is like what state Medicaid programs do around audio only. This is the way we look at it at CCHP. Basically, you might see a higher number from other folks. It's because um, they may have made the statutory change. They may have passed the bill that says, oh, the Medicaid program will reimburse for audio only. CCHP doesn't count it until the Medicaid program actually comes out with a policy implementing it because you know, too often we, we've seen things pass in a bill, but then the Medicaid program takes a while to implement it. So we won't count it until we see it in like Medicaid policy and say, ah, this is how the program is going to implement that particular law because the law is passed, but then you need a, probably need an agency to, to like implement and put out regulations. So we won't do that until, we, so we won't count it as like, Yes, they're, they're reimbursing for audio only, just simply because the law may say that, but we don't know exactly how they're doing that. We have to wait for the Medicaid policy. So that's why our numbers and, and number of states might be lower than what other people are doing. I'll give you a good example. Like New York like passed a law a couple of months ago and did say like the Medicaid program would be doing some audio only, but they, the Medicaid program hasn't come out with their own policy yet. So we didn't count it. And then for... Um, the ones that are in like that brown color there, those are uh, communications technology-based services states. So CTBS does have an audio el element, audio only element in there as well with like their virtual check-in codes, you can do audio only. That was actually something that existed before COVID-19. Um, and these states do do that. So that's why we've colored them to sort of distinguish it that you know their audio only is sort of like that those CTBS services may not necessarily mean, oh, you can provide a consultation via live video or audio only. So that's that's how we've like distinguished that. So what's going on on the state level? So 
I'm going to provide you with information on what happened in 2020 and 2021, just because it's, it's kind of interesting to see because 2020, obviously, we were really in the beginning th stages of like the pandemic and like really at like, you know, some some um, serious points of it. And even during that time, there were there were 140 104 legislative bills passed in 36 days. We don't quite know if all of them were related to COVID. Obviously, if they mentioned something about COVID um, that was related to the pandemic. So we're not quite sure some of these bills were sort of in the works before COVID-19 and they were just being carried through in the legislative process. But that's what happened. What we didn't really see as much of um, last year which we commonly see with state legislation are bills related to licensure or like starting a demonstration or pilot pro um, project. We didn't see a whole lot of that last year. Some examples such as, I, as I mentioned a moment ago, New York adding audio only definition of telehealth for Medicaid, Michigan requiring Medicaid to cover remote patient monitoring and West Virginia adding a new private payer law. So these are just some examples that we saw in 2020, permanent examples. And again, interesting that you had states making permanent changes in 2020. So they were a little bit ahead of curve of like what the feds were doing. What we're seeing in 2021, we're seeing more states starting to make those final decisions on what they're going to do around telehealth policy, but they're really struggling with a couple of things. One of them being the audio only. What do we keep around? How much of audio only do we keep around? Do we keep around audio only and have that be an option? Not all states are doing that. South Dakota recently in their Medicaid program, they, did, they cut off audio only back in July. So not all states are keeping audio only around and some may be doing it in a limited capacity. Legislative trends that we're seeing, licensure and board guidelines, and then pilots and demonstrations have made a reappearance, as did licensure. What have been some of the telehealth changes that we've seen in 2021? Temporary extensions. We saw that both for California and Connecticut, they're doing temporary extensions. Licensure changes. So Arizona and Florida, they're not requiring a full license for their state. They will have a registration process. So that's like a little bit chipping away of those licensure elements there. Private payer laws, audio only payment, we're seeing that again um, in some of the states that are out there. And then the big thing is the end of public health emergencies. We get a lot of calls at CCHP saying like, well, what happens? Ohio is ending their public health emergency. What does that mean for the telehealth um, waivers? And the question, the answer is always like, well, it depends. If a state tied their telehealth waivers to a state public health emergency, that may be like the waiver ends, but some states, California, for example, tied the majority of their, of their waivers to the federal public health emergency, and that's still in effect. So that's still sticking around. What's going on in California? So California, um, there were two bills and they were budget trailer bills that has significant elements in there related to telehealth. One was AB 133, and that had the more specific items related to telehealth. And what it said was, basically, we're extending the temporary Medi-Cal telehealth policies until the end of 2022. In the meantime, Department of Healthcare Services will convene an advisory stakeholder group to discuss what will be the permanent changes that DHCS will then be introducing, the administration will be introducing in the budget proposal for 2022. They also said that, um, you know, they will protect pre-COVID-19 policies because when, when um, the initial proposals came out from the administration early in the year, there was some confusion. What they were proposing is like, are you rolling back some of the stuff that we had before COVID? So they clarified saying, no, we're not going to do that. Um, and it also allowed DHCS to authorize remote patient monitoring, but possibly with a separate fee schedule there. Other provisions that were in there were related to different programs here, such as, you know, creates a child and youth behavioral initiative, in, which incentivizes school-based telehealth, and then data requests for providers to form healthcare work policy, where telehealth was one of the components of data that they're requesting. The other bill that was also a trailer bill was SB 156, and there was a significant amount of broadband funding in there, $6 billion. So it was really to look at that middle mile of broadband and also that um, last mile of support. So these are a couple of 
elements in there for the for the broadband bill. Uh, the coalition that I mentioned earlier, we're working on a fact sheet for this. CCHP does have a fact sheet for the AB 133, the previous slide. So we'll also have a fact sheet for this one available soon as well too. But these are the things that are going on in California. Now, you're probably asking me who's gonna be a member of the advisory stakeholder committee. The HCS had an application process. It's closed now. So, um, but they had an application process about 10 days ago where they said, submit your application to be on this committee because we are going to have a small group. We're going to have like about, I think they said 25 to 35 people at most. There are some like no members on there because in the trailer bill, there were specific members named in there. It was like Planned Parenthood. California Primary Care Association, basically they were supporters of a bill that was running parallel to what the administration was proposing. So they took the sponsors of those bills and said like, they're gonna be definite members of this committee. But everybody else was open to an application process. Like I said, that's closed now. We don't quite know who those other members are. Um, initially, DHCS said that they would be contacted today, the 27th, then I um, or 30th. So we would know um, by the 30th who is actually going to also be appointed to that committee. It is incredibly ambitious, I think, because they are saying that they want this committee to do this to meet and provide feedback, work to have proposals done so they can introduce them in the budget for next year. If you look at the timing of that, we don't know who the, is on their committee yet. The calendar that they laid out, I think the first stakeholder committee meeting is September 22nd. That's an incredibly ambitious timeline because for them to have proposals to be introduced in the January version of the governor's um, budget for 2022-2023, uh, um, they would need to like basically have that done, I would think no later than November because they would need time to like basically include it in that budget proposal, which comes out in early January. So it's an ambitious timeline of like getting that stakeholder work group work done. Basically it's compressed over two months. So I don't quite know how they're going to facilitate all that because they did say, they only laid out like three meetings in the application process that would take place with the full stakeholder groups. So they did say something about smaller work groups. So that's what's going on in California. We're good essentially with our temporary stuff until the end of next year. Not quite sure what they're going to propose as something permanent. Won't probably we'll get have an idea if you're a member of the stakeholder group, but you know, may not really have a full picture until January of 2022. And this is the CCHP website. Also, um, you can subscribe to our newsletter. And I think that is it. So I'm happy to take questions now. And I think there's like a bit of stuff in the chat box too. Yes. Thank you so much, May, for that informative presentation. It's great to see that there's movement now um, towards making telehealth um, less <laughs> ha have less barriers. And I know for myself, like it's great that there is a consideration for this audio only version. Uh, given that not everybody has reliable access to the internet. Um, participants, I was going to say, feel free to put additional questions in the chat. Um, if you'd like to come off mute, uh, you can ping me, you can unmute, or you can raise your hand, and I'll uh, try to make sure you can ask your question live. There are a couple. Uh, um, so one is around the definition of in-person. I believe this when you were showing your 20, the 2020 proposed changes. Um, does that mean like you need to go to a clinic in person, or they, do they need to be seen by a telehealth provider? You need to be seen by a telehealth provider. The telehealth provider who's providing those, who will be providing those services um, via telehealth needs to be the person that you need to see in person. Now, again, this is only if you are trying to take advantage of, of the, the exceptions that they had in the Consolidated Appropriation Act, which means geographic limitations as would not apply to this interaction that you can do it from the home. If you are trying to receive mental health services and you're, you're doing it sort of like the original way that Medicare would allow, like you go into like a clinic and then they like hook you up with a telehealth provider, you don't need to have that in-person visit with that telehealth provider. It's only if you're trying to slot that visit into that exception of like not being in that rural area. And also if you're trying to have the service in the home. Great, thank you. That was very helpful for me. Um, I hope whoever asked the question that answers it. 
Um, there was also another, a couple questions just on the theme of like out of state. So could you speak mm -hmm. to like location services out of state? Where does the patient need to be versus provider? And as it regards to, are they talking about licensure? Are they talking about? Our reimbursement challenges, as well as just in thinking about um, what are the rules around location for a patient at time of a telehealth visit? So location of patient, where the patient is really dictates like um, what license the provider needs to have. So that's one thing there. So if your patient, if you're a California provider and your patient's located in Nevada in time during the telehealth interaction, unless you know Nevada has some sort of exception to you, like some sort of licensure exception, you're gonna to need to be licensed um, in Nevada. If you're talking about reimbursement, uh, again, it's it's going to depend also on like who is reimbursing you. If they have some particular rules about like, um, for the most part, most of those reimbursement when you're talking about Medicare and Medicaid, they'll have like the general rules of like, well, you need to be licensed in the patient state. You need to, you know, um, check their identity and everything like that. Um, but uh, uh, some of that was temporarily waived, at least by Medicare, temporarily waived um, during the pandemic as well too. So I, I, I'm struggling a little bit on like, you know, what they're talking about. I, I do see the question. And again, I'm a little confused by what are the rules around location of the patient at the time of the telehealth visit? you have like your location of of like geographic it, it, it it's going to vary i would need to know like if they're asking specifically of like site are they talking about clinic or being in the home are you talking about geographic are you talking about state it's like all different policies that are related around there so and we're also in COVID, where there are a lot of temporary waivers as well too so right now um what CMS Medicare is on because we're underneath the public health emergency and there's a temporary waiver, the patient can be in any type of geographic location. The patient can um, be in their home. Um, however, the provider, when they're trying to treat that patient, depending on the state, because state rules licensure, it's not Medicare. It, Medicare can just say like, well, we're not going to ding you underneath our Medicare policy, but you still got to abide by the state rules, state laws. That would like rule on whether they need a license in that state. So that's that's kind of where that kind of stands there. And then Medicaid can be something completely different. So Medicaid may may not have any geographic restriction, but they may say like we're not going to allow it to take place in the home. Um, and and for the most part, they probably will say like you need to be licensed in our state. That's super helpful and definitely something to consider with people um, doing remote work, et cetera. It's like, you know, are you able to continue care as their provider or you know, do you need to let them go when they move across state lines? There's also a general question, I believe just for attendees. So I'll ask this and then we can definitely open it up. So if somebody wants to come off mute um, to respond to Carol's question, and that is when credentialing a panel of providers by proxy, how do you onboard them with the insurance company if you intend to bill to recoup your expenses as you are paying the contract providers per the contract? Does anybody want to try to take us, try to answer Carol's question? Has anybody gone through this before? It's a weird one and coming up more and more now that people are uh, paneling um, physician groups to do remote care like overnight. Um, so yeah, so if we hire on say at UCSF, a group of physicians and we've done the credentialing by proxy like delegated onboarding and credentialing and by proxy. Um, if I want to build those providers out to a contracted insurance company, I probably have to obtain those provider signatures on a signatory page to be able to bill them to a contracted payer. And I'm just wondering if there's anything easier out there or if I'm just, if I'm just gonna, you know, inundate people with signature pages. DocuSign, of course, but. 
It's, a contract, has, it's, it's a contract, Carol. I'm not sure there's going to be a way around. <laughs> I know. I know. Their lawyers are probably going to insist on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Always looking for that easy out. There's got to be something. Thank you. Not when they got lawyers on retainer there. So <laughs> yeah. So I don't see any more questions in the chat at this point. Um, I'll make another call to see if anybody has any questions. And I guess I'll ask one for the group. Like, has oh, here's one from Philip. Great. Um, how do you build a place of service? There's some confusion on the rules if the billing should be originating where is the patient's location, like a home or a skilled nursing facility, um, or distant where which is provider's location. I don't think for when you you bill, you have to like put their their address. I mean, you and the billing is done, you're putting like the distance site provider's business address. I mean, you're not putting like the rich, well, in the cl clinic, I don't think you put the originating site address in there. I mean, the originating site like confirms that they've done this. I think there's a place where you can like put, maybe Carol's more, would probably know this better. Carol? Maybe I can help with that too. Or Rebecca's on here too. Yeah. Um, so um, it, it yeah, depends on the payer. Um, most payers, the, and it also depends on your facility type. So like if you're a hospital and you're billing the patient's home as an extended outpatient during COVID, then sometimes they want that patient's address. Um, but it, it really depends on the payer. But for the most part, again, depending on your facility type, you should just be putting place of service code zero two. So I'm not sure if that's yeah. where you're going with that. If, if you're looking for what place of service code. If you're anybody else but an RHC and an FQHC, like a private practitioner, you're going to be billing as zero two. Um, otherwise, it's going to be like an eleven, um, possibly a fifty. Carol, you can jump in anytime now. <laughs> okay, Rebecca. So um, you could. Um, what you do is you list the provider's home address if that's their primary place of quote unquote business. Um, with CMS, but on the billing, you list the facility's address. That seemed to be the interpretation we got a um, couple of months ago uh, on the CTEL board. Um, we were told that uh, Center for Telehealth and ELAW, if, if you, if you, yeah, so like say you're, you're a psychiatrist and you're practicing from home, you don't want people to know where you live, so, um, but you are providing services on behalf of a facility. They list your home address um, with CMS as a place of business, but what goes out on the bill is um, the facility's address. But the facility does have to bill that 1500 to the MAC, if it's CMS, to the MAC where the psychiatrist is sitting. So if they're in Oklahoma and they're providing services to somebody in California, um, that bill has to go to the MAC for, um, did I just say Oklahoma? <laughs> you said Oklahoma, yeah. And, and that also getting back to the provider location question, yes. earlier, that will affect also your rate too, because it's like the Oklahoma rate as opposed to the California rate. Yeah, the conversion right. rate is a lot lower. Yeah. Well, not a lot lower. Everyone's only getting 32 bucks an hour now, but, or RVU, but um, it, the conversion factor is lower. Yeah, it, it, does, it does impact you on because they go by like, well, you're located because and we're going to take in like what your cost of living is their provider. So that's all we're going to give you. So I hope that helps, Philip. See, this is why I said it was great in the connect that, that they put educational materials in there because of all these like weedy fine tool things where we try our best to like try to sort it out. But if CMS isn't giving us a straight answer, I mean, we have to like just do our best with it. Right. And I think yeah. the patient's address part is still really like confusing and an issue for providers. So, um, and I don't know that may have you seen, has CMS come out with clarification on whether or not providers are supposed to put the patient's address in the bills. I, I, I have not. There. I'm not. I mean, there's 
there's a lot of things CMS needs to come out with to clarify, <laughs> to clarify stuff. But no, I, I haven't seen that, Rebecca. Okay, yeah. So just to help clarify that last bit um, for Philip, in terms of the patient's address, I would just check with your payer. And if you're talking about CMS, I would call the MAC and check with the MAC. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes I don't know if the MAC knows for certain, but they might have at least their policies on it as well, too. Well, thanks so much for answering Philip's question. That was very informative. I had no idea that like you could even, I guess, put the provider address name down in light of the building. So it's helpful for me as well. Looks like RJ has a question. Um, is there a pending legislation that promotes or funds language access programs for LEAP populations for telehealth adoption at either state or national levels? Not that I'm offhand aware of. I think there, there is, like in some of the broadband um, funds, there were like small bits of funding for, also for some like educational stuff as well, but it wasn't really defined. So I'm, I'm racking my brain if there's anything on the federal level, nothing that I can really think of offhand on the federal level, but there were, there were 100 bills. There could have been something buried in there. Um, but it is an area that is like oh, resources in general for, for providers and patients and, and consumers on, around telehealth, such so as like educational materials and stuff like that. It is very scarce. There's not, there's not a lot of that issued on the federal or the state levels for the most part. Um, the telehealth resource centers, we try to do our best. We have limited funding, but we try to do our best with what we have to like try to have as many resources out there in multiple languages and in multiple channels to try to like, you know, service as many people as we can. But as far as like that investment, a specific investment, I can't think of anything offhand. I can I can look into it and like send something to like Aislinn if she wants to like send it out to folks. But right offhand, I can't think of anything. It's up for maybe again in that broadband. Funding. There was like a very vague sort of like, oh, some of this, again, it's, it's legislative language. It can sometimes get vague, vague language about like educational materials and, and things like that. It wasn't a lot of money though, but I was like, well, it's, it's nice that it kind of looks like it's doing what I think it's doing there, that there may have been, there could be something in there, depending on how they decide to administer those funds. Thanks, May. That was super helpful. Are there any additional questions? So I know that we are at the end of the hour. There's been a lot of questions in the chat about the slides. And I just wanted to call out for everybody that the slides will be posted um, after the recording next week. And an email will be sent out to all registrants with the slides. So um, if you had asked that question or if you're looking for the slides, they will be available there. Um, I think we'll keep this Zoom open for a couple more minutes. I see a lot of people giving May a shout out. So thanks so much, May, for your presentation. It was super informative and there's a lot to dig into there. And so I hope everybody does look at the slides afterwards to better understand the rules and regulations. Well, thanks for having me. And thank you also for my backup, Carol Yarborough of UC San Francisco, Rebecca Picasso of Blue Shield. So thanks guys. Always, always. <laughs> Anytime.